Hey guys, before we start today's episode, I wanted to share with you a last minute special show that me and my friends are putting on next week. In case you didn't know, me and all of the Normal Boots guys are going to be at Indie PopCon next weekend on July 7th through the 9th in Indianapolis, Indiana at the Indiana Convention Center. But what we just added today is a special one night only event, a night with Normal Boots. It's happening on July 8th at 8 p.m. to 11 p.m in the Wilmington University room number 132. This live event is going to feature all kinds of game challenges, Q and A's, and more. Tickets are 30 bucks, but if you want the full VIP experience for 50, you get first dibs on where you want to sit, You'll get a free exclusive con poster signed by all of the current members of Normal Boots, and you'll get a personalized Polaroid picture with all of us. This portion of the event takes place before at 7 p.m. Now, there's only 100 tickets available for the VIP package, and general seating is limited as well, so you need to act fast. Note, for those of you who are planning to not go to Indie PopCon, this is a separate ticketed event. So, if you want to buy a ticket and come, you totally can. I hope to see you guys join us, and we'll see you guys next weekend. Thank you for watching, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. Now, as you know, today is a very big and special day for the hardcore PlayStation fans out there. Today marks the release of the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy for PS4 out today. You can go get it right now. I don't have it yet, because... We shot this before the game came out, and Sony doesn't love me enough. That's right, Sony. I'm calling you out. Love me, please. Now, I haven't gotten to sit down and play through the whole game yet, even though it just came out today, but I did get some hands-on with it over at Retrospomisen in Norway, and from what I played of the game, yeah, it feels like Crash Bandicoot 1, 2, and 3. And honestly, I think time will tell how much we really love this game in the long run. On the other hand, this was actually a little frustrating because I've already reviewed the first three games and it would be really nice to dive into the Insane Trilogy with a new, fresh perspective. And a lot of you guys were really pushing me to revisit those games on the PS4 remastering, but I wanted to wait. I really wanted to give it enough time to let it pass. So instead, I decided to do a game that has a bit more of a cult following. Going into this is going to be interesting because I have never played Crash Team Racing, and so I don't really feel like I have any nostalgia glasses attached to this game. But if you've learned anything about me over the years, it's that I'm a die-hard optimist. And if there is something cool to find about Crash Team Racing that separates it from the pack and makes it its own unique game, well, I'm probably gonna find out what it is. Let's go ahead and get down to completing this bad boy. Let's do it. Yes! Right. In the late 1990s, the quote-unquote genre of Mario Kart ripoffs was at its height. Mario Kart 64 was a huge hit just a few years earlier in February of 97, and less than a year after that, it missed a sea of awfulness including titles like Atari Karts and Mega Man Battle and Chase. Rare took it to the next level with Diddy Kong Racing, which added not only hovercrafts and airplanes, but also a massive sprawling story mode, which gave the game some extra meatiness and cemented its status amongst fans as a cult classic. It was in this climate that Naughty Dog first got the idea to toss their hat into the kart racing ring and came to Sony and Universal with their own unbranded racer, running a bootleg version of the Crescent Island track from Diddy Kong Racing on the PS1. They announced their intentions to make it a crash game, and everyone quickly agreed, seeing their opportunity to do to Mario Kart 64 what Sonic the Hedgehog did to Super Mario World. Make it a cool, extreme version that wasn't just for babies, but still had a weird, colorful 90s mascot with plenty of attitude kind of, that would slowly lose all mainstream appeal over the next 10 years and end up in gamer heaven next to that weird Game Boy Advance SP with the tribal tattoo on it. I've seen it, that's weird, don't try and argue otherwise. But hey, it seemed to have worked for at least a little while. The Crash Bandicoot franchise still has plenty of diehard fans. A lot of real respected people out there call Crash Team Racing the best kart racer of all time. And in the years that followed, it spawned two quasi-sequels in the form of Crash Nitro 
Kart and Crash Tag Team Racing. So that's gotta be good, right? Not to mention, this is the last Crash Bandicoot game that Naughty Dog ever touched. You know, the developers that literally can do no wrong. And honestly, that alone is reason enough for me to complete this game, even if racing games are notoriously tough for completionists like myself. So please, Crash Team Racing, don't do me dirty. I'm down for some time trials and collectibles, but this is a Naughty Dog game, so I know there's gonna be at least some of that. But please, please, don't do that racing game thing where you make the last run of things you need to unlock completely impossible. What's the point of breaking my spirit after I've gotten so good at the game, you know? But up to this point, I've loved the Crash Bandicoot franchise, and Crash is my good, good friend. Even though he really screwed me over in the third game with all those time trials for the Platinum Relic, but he'd never do that again, would he? He's way too chill, way too cool, and way too extreme to roast me like that. He's got, like, too many pizza parties and kickflips to worry about, right? Right, Crash? <laughs>time these racing games just come up with some brainless car themed framing device to tie a bunch of races together but you know what maybe crash team racing will spice it up a little bit okay so there just happens to be a town race going on okay not not the greatest out the gate but i guess you have to get the carts involved somehow maybe there's some cool behind the scenes drama to fuel the oh that's an alien that's an alien named nitrous oxide from the planet gasmoxia Okay, and he claims he's the best racer in the galaxy. And if he wins, he's gonna turn Earth into a parking lot and enslave everyone, so someone on planet Earth has to beat him. And Crash is the one. Crash and, Crash and friends. That's what we got. That's the best of the best. Okay, so maybe it's not the spiciest story ever, but at least it tries to do something to make it feel like a mainline Crash game. The game loosely ties a new plot to a familiar world with characters we know and love united in the cause of saving the world. If you ask me, that's miles better than most racers. Even the ones I love, like Diddy Kong Racing. Hell, with Diddy Kong Racing, we only really personally knew one or two of the characters' tops. But with Crash Team Racing, we've got Crash, Cortex, and even that gangster-ass polar bear. He is still the cutest dude in the Crash universe. The visuals are what I would expect from a PS1 title. They're not the prettiest, but they're endearing. Even with the world at stake, with your sworn enemies racing next to you, throwing items at you, things always look enjoyable. There's no escaping the awkward puberty-esque visuals that existed in the early polygonal game days, but CTR makes up for it with its vibrant backgrounds and characters. Everybody from the Crash trilogy that you'd expect to be here is here, and they make pretty good cart mascots. It's obvious who and what each mascot's cart type is, and both in and out of races, their individual character traits shine through clearly. While the backgrounds are somewhat recognizable as set pieces from previous games, they still come off as a bit generic and barren. Their blandness might be due to the fact that those same locales were generic even in the original trilogy, but I don't even remember them that way at all, and that might be due to what could have kept the stages in CTR from feeling so empty. These stages would have been a lot more memorable and fun, with some recognizable enemies acting as stage hazards all over the place. Even if the developers were trying to avoid having their racetracks chocked full of things ready to kill you, they could have at least made things more visually appealing by just having those same dudes peppered all over throughout the backgrounds. And if you want to really kick it up a notch, it would have been cool to feature hazards that actually temporarily kill characters similar to Crash in the previous games. The sound design in Crash Team Racing isn't awful, but it's not great either. The music is the same brand of bodacious, island-esque music from the Crash franchise, and although these tracks fit perfectly, you'll never really find find yourself humming them. The soundtrack doesn't get in your face, it just kind of stays out of the way. Like the chubby kid at a dance. That was me. The sound effects, however, are extremely noticeable. This could be kind of useful since they can help you tell exactly who's sneaking up on you in the middle of a race and what kind of weaponry they're packing. But sometimes it seems like these sound effects are way too high in the audio mix. Just listen to Coco clacking away on her keyboard after a race. 
Look, if you have to write a paper, maybe don't write it on the winner's pedestal, Coco. It's Crash's moment today, not yours. Everyone in Crash Team Racing has voice acting. They even got Clancy Brown to return to be Cortex and Uka Uka. And even the small little cutscenes you get when you fight a boss go a long way towards making these feel like the same characters you know from the mainline games they're from. Papu move so fast, you munch tracks. Crash Team Racing may be rough around the edges, but it is still a thoroughly enjoyable example of old school PS1 gaming. The fact that it doesn't look or sound that great is not so bad since Crash and his friends are a part of it. Even if you've no nostalgia for Crash whatsoever, you can take one look at this game and be put in the mood for some innocent fun. Now get the f out of my way, I'm the best! Get wrecked, you scrubs! You think this is a game? I don't f around! Crash Team Racing contains several different game modes, including Arcade Mode, which is your basic Grand Prix versus the entire cast of racers. There's also multiplayer modes where you can race against your pals or battle against them, depending on how much you hate them, but you'll probably be spending most of your time focusing on the Adventure Mode. Think of it as a bunch of different types of races that you can choose from using a hub world that you have access to between races. You've got regular races, one-on-one -on -one boss battle races, purple crystal collectathon races, and of course, the godforsaken relic races. The races are split up into a bunch of different worlds that you unlock by winning all the races in one area, and then beating the boss for a key to the next area. There's also a ton of other stuff to collect once you beat all the bosses and take on nitrous oxide. If you've ever played a kart racer before, you pretty much know what to expect. If you haven't, allow me to elucidate. You race around a track three times, pick up item boxes, and use the stuff inside to make your friends cry. I really like the items in Crash Team Racing over Mario Kart at times. A lot of these items are super unique and do way different things, while also being pretty nostalgic to the Crash Bandicoot series. It's really funny seeing your friends hopping around to avoid instant death. But surprisingly, I found myself liking what's usually a boring part of kart racers. More often than not, the common collectibles you'd find around the tracks are pretty boring. And in the case of Mario Kart, it's really hard to tell what the coin collectibles even did for you at one point. But their equivalent in CTR, the Wampa Fruit, are so much better. The Wampa Fruit play a sound and start glowing once you collect 10. And not only do they make you go faster, but they supercharge your weapons too. It feels much more like an actual part of the game. And I do like it here better than I do in any other kart racer. Once you beat the boss of a world, if you're dumb like me and want to complete things, you must go back and collect all the C, T, and R tokens in each level to earn a red red, green, purple, blue, or yellow gem. There's four of each color. These aren't super hard to get, but they are kind of hidden. But their purpose is to show off all the different shortcuts on each level. Once you get all of one colored gem, it opens up a corresponding gem cup, which doesn't have any more tokens or relics to collect inside. Finish four races with the most total points, and for the first four cups, you'll unlock one of the bosses as a playable character. Now that's pretty cool on its own, right? But for the purple cup, that fifth and final cup, You'll unlock the big bad nitrous oxide himself! Or that's probably what everyone thought at first, but instead, almost like a weird ass punchline to a joke that nobody was paying attention to, you get this weird bootleg character they call Fake Crash. But I'm gonna call him Trash Bandicoot. Why do I call it Trash Bandicoot when it's clearly Fake Crash, you ask? Because Trash Bandicoot is a better name than Fake Crash. Up next, you gotta grab all these relics. These also get unlocked after you beat a world's boss. And each track has three different difficulties, the sapphire, gold, and platinum relics, which you can get by finishing a relic race in the lowest amount of time possible. To do this, you have to smash time crates, which pause time for the number of seconds it says on the box. Getting the sapphire is pretty tough to start, 
Gold is barely on the edge of doable, and Platinum, which basically just requires you to hit every single possible time crate, is totally freaking insane! But if you're that skilled, you can instantly get the Platinum Relic out the gate on the first attempt, which, let's be real, most of us aren't! Each race took me between 45 minutes to an hour just to properly find and plot out a course to take. Beating the actual times took even longer, and by the time I was halfway through, getting the Platinum Relics just started to feel like trying to to knock down a brick wall with my forehead. Speaking of bashing my skull in, let's not forget that Crash Team Racing has its own dedicated time trial mode, which features even more dastardly races designed to crush your soul. These time trials are far more traditional than the ones you'll find in the adventure mode. There are no boxes you can crash into to freeze time. It's just you, the ghost you're racing against, and mountains and mountains of salt. Look, no matter how you slice it, this mode is brutal. Some of the trials are pretty reasonable, but almost Almost everyone reaches a point where you have to become superhuman in order to beat it. Just being able to compete against the ghost takes hours and hours of practice. This is exactly the kind of thing I was afraid of. This is why I'm terrified of racing games. And here we are again to the part of the show where I go crazy. What happened, Crash? Remember earlier when I asked if you got my back? Why didn't you have my back, Crash? Why? All told, as fun as the adventure mode is, starting from scratch and watching it up to the credits roll once doesn't take long at all. However, this only represents about 10 to 50% of the total time that I spent with the game, since to extend its length, CTR basically just throws a bunch of super hard challenges at you that will make you cry. I don't know what I did, but Crash is coming at me harder than he came at Mario in the 90s. What did I do to you? What? Tell me what I did. I've been supporting you for years. That trilogy better be good. That insane trilogy better be real good, Crash. CTR provides a lot of incentives for players to really dig deep to unlock everything in the game. With arcade mode specifically, beating every cup on every difficulty will unlock three more maps. The parking lot, the north bowl, and the lab basement. You get nothing for beating the game with every character, so pick your favorite and have a blast. That's the easy stuff right here. Like most PlayStation games of the era, there are a ton of cheat codes that will manipulate some of your experiences if you so desire. Things like infinite boosts, items, hell, you can even unlock a demo for Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage. You can also unlock all the secret characters with cheats, but we're going to be doing it the real way by completing the game. However, there is one secret character that can only be accessed by a cheat code, and that's Penta Penguin. Oh, look how cute that little guy is. In adventure mode, as you progress in knocking things out, you'll see there's a percentile meter for your progress as you do so. Eventually, once you've beaten every stage, defeated every boss, conquered every gem cup, which will get you five of the seven secret characters, and acquired every platinum relic in the game, you'll get a 101% ending. Nitrous Oxide leaves Earth just like he said he would, and you get confetti and cute little blurbs over the credits, just like in any sports movie that tells you where all the characters ended up in life. Good for her. I'm really happy for her. Oh, that just warms my heart. You know what? That explains a lot. After that, there's a cool little scrapbook video that shows the team designing all of the Crash games over the past years. There's tons of cool art and photos here, but after a few minutes of that, you're basically done with adventure mode. Oh man, ain't time trial mode a bitch. Once you get a good enough time on a given track, though what those times are I can only guess because it never actually shows you a goal, you unlock the ghost of entropy from Crash Bandicoot Warped. All of the entropy track times are pretty tough to beat, but once you beat them all, you'll get him as a playable character. But then, after the entropy times, comes the nitrous oxide times. And here's the freaking thing, maybe, just maybe, they've got a slightly larger margin of error, but they're just as hard as the goddamn Platinum Relic races. But you know what the worst part is? You still don't unlock nitrous oxide as a playable character. In fact, you don't unlock anyone. Instead, 
All you get for finishing the hardest time trial races in the game, which arguably may be just the tiniest bit easier than the relic races you had to deal with to get the true ending before, you unlock instant access to the same exact scrap video as before! <sighs> In my completionist playthrough of Crash Team Racing, there were seven secret racers unlocked, 54 relics acquired, 20 CTR tokens collected, 16 racing trophies won on all difficulties, 88 hours and 37 minutes of total playtime, and one cute ass polar bear that is still the best goddamn character in the game who's a good boy you're a good boy yeah yeah i'm gonna jump on your head you're such a good boy you're such a good boy you're a good boy crash team racing is a solid solid kart racer that's so much more than just mario kart with crash bandicoot characters it probably had the best controls of any kart racer at the time it innovates in just the right places and between the voice acting and the polish it has it's no surprise that a game this dated looking still holds such a strong cult status for so many fans today ctr is a game that i had a lot of fun with and in a rare twist Getting good at it was actually more enjoyable than it was frustrating for the most part. Until the near total perfection it required for me to beat the nitrous oxide time trials and unlock those stupid platinum relics. Look, for some weird reason, Naughty Dog really loves forcing its audience to be super good at time trial based tasks. And while it's fun for a while, it gets frustrating because it stands in your way from getting things done. And it wasn't just unfair, it was demoralizing. For me to get the exact same reward for doing two very, very difficult, time-consuming tasks was extremely unsatisfying. There was a lot of cool stuff to see and unlock as I went along, don't get me wrong, but the time sync required to go from almost completed to totally completed, and the fact that all I got was a short video of some concept art for doing it makes it feel like this whole thing is pretty hard to recommend for a completionist out there. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell if you want to make sure you don't miss anything. That would be great. I'd appreciate the support. If you liked today's episode, leave a like and a comment. And hey, if you missed last week's episode on ARMS, give it a click right here. ARMS was fun. It was a fun game. Fun, fun, fun. Hope you guys liked it. You're all awesome. I'll see you next week. I'm gonna go complete another game. Because guess what? It's what I do, mother The mic is... Bitches!